uh, June. So the meeting is already uh, streaming live on YouTube. Yes, I'm setting up. Uh, I think uh, it should be like done in 30 seconds. Let me just uh, double check and welcome Sakura. Hi. Hi, Sakura. Hi. Hi, how are you? Thanks for the invitation. I was Thank just trying to figure out how to share this case. I connected my iPad, um, which is, I think, the other. Um, okay. I think I'm connected twice, and you made me co-host. Excellent. You're way ahead of the game. And, but I should not share the screen yet. So I try uh, it. Please. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Great. So you can see. Yep. Yes. Great. So I, I, I should stop screen sharing now, or do you, I'll just leave it? Um, leave it like this. Um, I will leave it. Okay. I fantastic. Guess we, uh, maybe starting maybe one minute. Yeah. Perfect. Okay, maybe let's get started. Okay. So, uh, Julian, this is already live on YouTube, right? Uh, it's live and let's record. Oh, uh, I think it's a bit too early, I think. Uh, maybe wait one, one minute, just one minute. All right. Okay, one more minute. Mm -hmm. One more minute. <laughs> yeah, I think people are still joining. Also, we are looking forward to your second slides, which you have some good explanation. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. uh, I had a react to this. I actually first had to translate it, like, the kanji into hiragana because my kanji is oh. really uh, rather limited. So I, I had to kind of, <laughs> oh, <I see laughs> what are they actually writing there? <laughs> um, the German, I don't have an issue with, but yeah. Yeah. I, I was uh, actually saying that more jokingly. I didn't mean to sort of induce you to. Actually. No, no. I, I really appreciate you say that because they feel me. I feel I'm doing good thing. <laughs> yeah. So because but, you my, it's for so many different languages, I was quite. I can't. Can't. I have no problem. But uh, to be honest, with hiragana, yeah. I am not a very, yeah. uh, not very good at. It. Yeah, but for me, it's the opposite because <laughs> it's easier to learn. Yeah. Okay, uh, shall we start? Yeah, fantastic. So, so uh, good morning, everybody. Welcome to CMSA Quantum Matter Seminar. Today, we are very glad to have Secure Shafer Namiki, who will tell us about higher form symmetries in string and M theory. Uh, please. Great, thank you very much. So, thanks, Du, and uh, you know, I, I think you're, you're quite a group of organized by our community only with Du and with Du, and so thanks very much for the invitation. Um, and it's great to be at CMSA. Uh, I've been following the, the seminars for the whole time, the past year, and it's been really a great series. And so it's an honor to actually speak here. I'd like to talk about some recent progress on higher form symmetries in string theory, M theory. Um, and I will comment uh, briefly at the beginning what I really mean by that, so that we're clear um, what exactly 
I'm talking about. It's based on a couple of papers with um, basically starting with work with Dave Morrison and Brian Willett uh, about a year ago, uh, and then subsequent work with uh, two fantastic postdocs, Laksha and uh, Fabio, uh, as well as uh, at the end, the second part of my talk will be about uh, work with my students, um, Marika, uh, Dawi, and uh, Fabio as well. So the goal is to discuss um, basically how in-string theory features of quantum field theories such as higher form symmetries um, and everything that comes with them are realized. And so of course I'm not talking in terms of you know uh, string compactification on compact manifolds. I'm thinking more in terms of how do we realize quantum field theories within string theory. Um, and essentially I think there are three different avenues that we can follow. One is sort of geometry. Um, so people will call it geometric engineering. So you have some non-compact space X um, and it has a boundary del X and that could for example be in M theory or in string theory and you get a quantum field theory. And because it's a non-compact space, uh, you have decoupled essentially gravity. You have sense of uh, gravity, basically you've decoupled it. You're just focusing on the gauge two degrees of freedom. And that's particularly important if you're trying to understand quantum field theories that are uh, generally quite difficult to uh, gain access to. For example, things that um, are strongly coupled like 5D or 6D uh, CFTs. So for these, we have very little other sort of access in terms of you know, characterizing them as just honest to God you know, Lagrangian field theories because they are UV fixed points. So the string theory approach of this geometric engineering is extremely powerful that you tell us about uh, properties of these theories. The other way is to take brains and to wrap brains on cycles or study defective theory on brains. And so for example, one of course big class there is to look at in five brains compactified, for example, on Riemann surfaces. So it's like class S type theories. And then there's a completely distinct set of ways of studying quantum field theories, of course, in, in string theory, which is holography. So there we look at the duals, so to speak, of quantum field theories. Most of the time people will focus on holography as an ADS CFT. So you have a, an ADS space time and a conformal field theory dual. And equally here you can ask, what about higher form symmetries um, in this context? Um, and what I'd like to focus on is mostly duals to not CFTs, but actually confining theories. So things like uh, the uh, confined duality uh, cascades uh, from quite a long time ago. So the goal is in these sort of categories of realizing quantum field theories uh, to characterize line operators, higher uh, defect operators, higher form symmetries, the anomalies um, in each one of these setups. And it's useful because as I emphasized, for example, in these, these setups here, because it gives us access to theories that might otherwise be uh, quite complicated to understand. So to answer basically Juven's question that he posed in the email to, that was circulated uh, this morning, um, basically the question he's asking here is, so I don't know whoever is speaking Japanese understands this part here. I had to actually put the hiragana on to actually see what it, it really means. Uh, uh, maybe some other speakers are German speakers. The question is, so, you know, there shouldn't be global symmetries in quantum gravity. So why the heck are you talking about these kinds of symmetries in uh, string theory and M theory? Um, the point is here, I'm really not thinking in terms of some compactification where I have gravity and everything coupled back in, but as a tool to engineer such theories, right? So in this sense, I'm not constrained by these uh, sort of quantum gravitational uh, restrictions. The main focus here is really on understanding the quantum field theories and the string or M theory construct is just a means of uh, achieving that. Okay, uh, so the talk today will deal with this part here in part one and this part here in part two, at least some aspects of that, of course it can cover everything. And then next week's talk will focus um, on this class S uh, both n equals two and n equals one. And that's a talk by Laksha Bardwaj and he'll talk about uh, sort of progress he's made on class S and higher form symmetries there, as well as um, the 
relation to n equals one and confinement from these types of constructions. Okay, so let me briefly motivate why we should be looking at higher form symmetries at all. I mean, this is, I think, sort of like bringing potatoes to Idaho, but still, you know, at CMSA, still we could remind ourselves why is it interesting to look at these higher form symmetries? Well, the charged objects are p-dimensional operators, are defect operators. The symmetries themselves are generated by topological um, co-dimension p plus one operators and the global symmetries of the theorem. That's how I would like to start thinking about them. And then uh, they can, for example, uh, influence or de 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 determine, for example, the global structure of the gauge group, um, which line operator spectrum you have would influence this. The symmetries have, uh, you can gauge them just like other zero form symmetries and they can have Toft anomalies and also can form sometimes higher groups. And at the end of the, in the second part of my talk, uh, we'll sort of see an example that indeed they're also interesting in terms of uh, diagnostics for confinement. So studying one form symmetries and how are the spontaneous broken or not uh, tells us whether the vacuum is confining or not. And so the goal is to take all that and then incorporate it into the string theory realizations. Uh, that's sort of the, the main goal of this talk. Is there a question? Uh, so actually just shout if, you, if there are questions, I can't really see the chat, I think maybe I can. Um, so please just unmute and, and ask questions. Um, so I'll start with um, just sort of this geometric engineering framework uh, in string theory and M theory for P form symmetries, most of the time one form symmetries, and then focus a bit on five dimensions where we've made particular progress recently. So let's start completely to bring everybody on the same page. Um, let's start sort of with uh, the simplest possible setup, pure gauge theory in four dimensions. It'll work very similar in other dimensions uh, for where everyone is most familiar with. So think of it as n equals four super young nulls or n equals one super young nulls. Um, and we have a simple Lie algebra G and the set of line operators, math Kali also, this is not yet the one form symmetry, but it's just a set of all possible line operators is characterized by a pair of weights, um, actually weights, magnetic weights and uh, weights, so a lambda E lambda M, um, which take values in the quotient of the weight lattice module root lattice, and um, that's isomorphic to the center and the lambda m's are in sort of the dual version of that, the magnetic weight lattice model, the cold lattice. So we should think of these as the Wilson lines, these as the top lines, and the full set of line operators for this pure G, young mill theory, is ZG plus ZG. So that's of course just the full set of line operators. We should not, in a given theory, not all of these are, are all present at the same time, because indeed uh, two line operators, if you pick them arbitrarily, they could be mutually not local. So there's a direct pairing between these pairs of weights. And in order for these line operators to be actually mutually local, uh, we have to satisfy that this is true. So this means if you now want to have a, a theory with a set of such consistent set of line operators, we pick a maximal subset in this L set here of commuting line operators. Um, and that's then what we'll call the one form symmetry of this theory. And another way of saying that this is like picking some polarization of this lattice L. So how does this, okay, so maybe one more comment, of course, so the one form symmetry has generators and those are two, two dimensional topological surface operators. And um, again, they're sort of the electric magnetic versions of that. Anyway, so I'll discuss these in the context of the M theory uh, compactification in a little bit more detail. So basically, we'll start with sort of the SU2 case, which is probably familiar to everybody. In this case, we have the center Z2, so we get L is Z2 plus Z2, so pure young nulls. And there are three sort of distinct choices of. Uh, maximal 
uh, commuting line operators in L. The first choice is generated by one comma zero, and that's just the Wilson lines. And the one form symmetry is then just the Z2E factor and the gauge group in this case is the SU2 gauge group. And then there are two further choices. Um, one is sort of the magnetic version of this first case. So we have zero one. And in that case, the, we retain this factor of the, the set of line operators. And so these are the Toft lines and the, this is the SO3, global SO3 uh, group, SO3 plus. And then the distinction between uh, this one and the next one is the three plus and minus comes because of the theta angle. There's a choice, you can shift the theta angle. That actually means we're shifting H gets replaced by H plus W and that's the third choice and that's SO3 minus. So these are for SU2, the three distinct choices that we can have for uh, the subsets of um, one form symmetries uh, in L. Just one comment that, of course, for n equals one supersymmetric theories, um, they also, these one form symmetries actually then have implications on the properties of the vacuum of these theories. So, for example, in this case, if you think of n equals one as sort of a deformation of n equals two, the two vacuum, one is the uh, monopole, the and the other one, the dion, um, the vacuum where the dions condense and the other one, the monopoles, then in this case here, both of these vacuum are confining, whereas and the case where we've picked H as the line operator, uh, the only the dionic one is confining and the switches. So here the monopole vacuum is the confining one. So these really have physical implications, this choice of one form symmetries. Okay, so that's so far field theory. Let me also say a few more words about uh, so general things in terms of p-dimensional p-form symmetry. So just generalizing this so we would have uh, p-dimensional charged objects and the charge operators are co-dimension p plus one topological ob objects, which then non-trivially link with these charged objects. As we said earlier, we can gauge them by turning on background p plus one gauge fields. So for p equals to one, um, this b2 is a background field that takes values, the cohomology, class with Zn, so or gamma n, gamma one, so this could, should be in general the one form symmetry values. So for SUN, this is Zn. And gauging means summing over these backgrounds. And we have top, top anomalies and sometimes also higher group structures where there is a mix, mixing between the uh, gauge transformation, so to speak, of the zero and the one form symmetries. So in, in continuous cases, this would mean either gauge transformation for the zero and the one form symmetries and they mix them up independent. And in the discrete case, we'll see that uh, momentarily, uh, how this sort of looks like in, in an example later on. Okay, so how do I actually detect higher form symmetries in string and M theory? And the, the story is actually very, very similar every single time. So it, it sort of relies on thinking about uh, what are really the line operators. If you're looking at one form symmetries, what are the line operators that are of interest? Um, how can you construct them given your string theory setting? So to start us off, let's look at type 2b. So the simplest possible compactification that isn't totally trivial. Uh, look at, let's look at type 2b on a Calabial threefold to 40 and equals to two. And in fact, these Calabiaos that I'll look at in a moment uh, are going to engineer sort of theories that are a subset of class S theories. And these Calabiaos are say ADE singularity, so C2 mod gamma fibered over Riemann surfaces of genus G. So these are essentially, you know, uh, geometric engineering of class S on CG. You could also put punctures here and that would refine sort of this geometric picture and the various things, how we can sort of enrich this, this picture. But essentially the simplest possible thing is you just have this sort of AD singularity over genus G Riemann surface. And that's a non-compact Calabi L3. So we don't worry about gravity or anything. So what are the line operators in this uh, thing? So we need essentially think of line operators as world lines of infinitely massive particles particles we get from these three brains wrapping certain cycles, in this case, three cycles. And compact three cycles just give us sort of 
particles. Um, and non-compact V-cycles, so these three brains wrapping on non-compact V-cycles uh, will then be line operators. So in this picture, the, the, the lines are D3s on relative three cycles, but modulo screening. So like with the Wilson lines, they can be screening. So in, like in field theory, I mean, they can be screening. In this case, the screening is by D3 is wrapping, of course, the compact cycles. Those are exactly uh, the particles that could screen the line operators. So in this type 2B setup of type 2B on color BL3, the coordinate goes to two, the full set of line operators is this quotient on relative homologies. So we can also think actually in terms of not just the geometry X and its boundary, right? So these are basically non-compact three sets because these are ones extending to the boundary. Um, we can also rewrite this in terms of using this sort of long Z sequence and homology as just cycles in the boundary geometry. So you're just looking at two cycles. So if you take basically this quotient here, you follow this through the chain. So basically those are the two cycles here, which map trivially into here, right? So that's besides describing this quotient. So it's the two cycles and the boundary of the calabial um, that are trivial once extended to X. So in this particular example, uh, what's the boundary? I didn't put any punctures in. So actually all you have is the boundary of the C2 mod gamma, that's a three sphere. So you get S3 mod gamma ADE, fibered over LG. And now we need to compute the second homology of that. And that's a simple exercise so that actually gets contributions from one cycles in this lens space and the one cycles in the Riemann surface. And then the set of line operators is precisely the abelianization of gamma ADE. And then that's all the one cycles in, in this quotient here. And then 2G for the one cycles in the base. Okay, so this is relatively straightforward. This abelianization checks out to be precisely the center of the ADE group that you're looking at. So this is sort of the simplest, I think, setup to think in terms of um, line operators, one form symmetries in uh, sort of string theory. Of course, I said, this is just a subclass of class S series. So if you want the full thing, that will be discussed next week. So what I would like to actually make, the, the point I'd like to make is that what we discussed here for type 2B is really much more general. So this actually extends not only to type 2B, but actually is a much more general story in terms of when, whenever you do a geometric engineering kind of framework, you always have this sort of relative homology story uh, occurring. So another setup, which um, is sort of natural in terms of what people have studied in the, in the past few years is looking at M-theory compactifications on various types of geometry. So that could be non-compact color BL3s, it could be non-compact G2s to engineer five-dimensional or four-dimensional series, gauge series. Yes. And again- so May I ask a quick question? Sure. So uh, in M theory or string theory itself, it does not have higher form symmetry, right? So, and, but- uh, It, it the does not have that, what? Uh, so M theory and string theory itself does not have higher form global symmetry. Absolutely uh, not. Yeah. That, uh, uh, if it's compactified on something that is non-compact because there are boundaries that would introduce uh, higher form symmetry in the rest of the space time, is that the uh, right conceptual picture? I, I, I always yes, so in fact, I will language. discuss this in a moment. So these things are indeed really dependent on the, there being a boundary and the different, for example, choices of, you know, so here we've, I, I was, I didn't, decide to dig into that further, but also here, right? You have to set a line operators. Now you need to pick a polarization. That choice actually is a choice you make at the boundary of the space. So that's mm -hmm. an asymptotic kind of flux that you need to specify. Mm -hmm. which often we don't, uh, but I'll talk about it briefly or a bit more in, in, in M mm -hmm. theory. That's an additional piece of data you need to specify to fully specify what gauge theory you actually engineer. Mm -hmm. And, and, and whether uh, Calabial is uh, singular or not, that's not a very important. That is absolutely not important. I so see. in fact, um, you could calculate, right? So basically, I will, let's take, for example, this 
this example here, right? So I could have calculated um, essentially this H2 for whether I have resolved this C2 mod gamma or not is not really that important, right? Basically it just says how you fill in this, this boundary. The boundary is S3 mod gamma ADE, but now you could resolve this, but that doesn't actually affect what happens on the boundary. The same will be true here. I could, for example, in 5D, calculate this, this homology fully on the Coulomb branch, or I could calculate it um, in a partially resolved phase, or formally, you should say, it, it also then holds also in the singular case. So it, it's not important um, that you have singularities, for example. That's yeah, thanks. Any other questions? So, but I would, I would like to actually discuss a little bit is here this, this case of the M theory um, compactifications because yeah, it sort of ties in with both five dimensional theories, but also four dimensional theories. And it, it sort of illustrates again, this sort of theme that these, these relative homologies will always compute for you these the higher form symmetries or the one form symmetries excuse me. So for M theory, we have uh -huh. two brains, we can wrap M two brains on two cycles. Uh -huh. Yes. Uh -huh. Sorry yeah. for interrupting, and I'm, yeah, embarrassed, yeah. I'm embarrassed to ask again, but uh, uh, can you rephrase your answer to the question I posed in the email? I think you yeah. said, said, probably said that, but I, I think uh, also Dupe probably also asked, uh, I think he clarified that some part of the question. No. Can, you, can you rephrase so the for answer? For example, what like you, this is the, 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 the yeah. So for example, if you're, if your Calabiao is a compact Calabiao, Right, all of these group are, groups are trivial because what are they calculating? They're calculating non compact two cycles, modulo compact two cycles. Now, there are no non compact two cycles once you compactify your Calabian. So, say you want to look at a string or M theory or string theory compactification on a compact space time, right? So, you basically have gravity, supergravity, the whole thing. Then in that compact space, you would not have a non-trivial one-form symmetry. This quotient is trivial. Because right, the way the, these, these, these line operators are computed is precisely you know, infinite, so infinitely extended, to the boundary extended two cycles or three cycles, modulo compact ones. And so one way of saying it is, once you actually bring, say, you, 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 you imagine uh, this Calabial coming from a decompactification of a compact manifold, then you now want to bring in sort of gravity, you basically compactify it. And at that moment, effectively, all these higher form, all these global symmetries are gone. Right? But here I'm not interested in this because I'm really focusing on this type of compactification will give us engineering of certain gauge theories or conformal field theories. And I want to use this formulation to learn something about them. That's sort of the point of view I'm taking. Is that clear? Thanks, thank you. Okay, so for um, M theory, we wrap M2 brains. You also can of course wrap M5 brains uh, on four cycles, you get the sort of a similar uh, effect here. So you actually get here, you have M2 brains, wrapped on non compact two cycles. And those actually, again, will be the line operators modulo than the compact two cycles, will just, which just give us um, the uh, particles that could screen these line operators. And so, for example, in the Calabiao case, these can be explicitly computed, and I'll give examples of that. Uh, in a moment. And then also for G2, for example, in the simplest G2 geometry, this is this Brian Solomon's geometry, when you have again an AD singularity now fibered over S3. It's very similar to what we did here for the Calabiao case. Um, that again is given by the abelianization of gamma AD. So the center of that. One question you can ask is so in this setup, what are actually now these topological surface operators, right? So these are this is calculating essentially the line operator spectrum. And what actually is the set of surface operators that sort of are the generators of this uh, one form symmetry. So we said 
uh, M2s on non-compact, so non-compact two cycles and one cycles in space time. So this is all in space time this is in the compactification space. And um, those are the line operators. And if now, for example, in this G2 case, I pick omega seven and I pick a two cycle in space time and a five form, a non-compact uh, five cycle, sorry, in, in, in the compactification space. And then can write down this operator here where G7 is just star G4. And this is now going to play the role exactly of the topological surface operator in space time um, that will have non trivial linking and will compute exactly the charge of this line operator in, uh, this, compact, in this compactification. So, more in detail, I'd right? say so omega 7 is sigma 2 omega 5. M2 is wrapped on sigma 1 omega 2. And now both in the G2 and in space time, these things will link and the charge based by inserting this operator, uh, this Wilson line actually will have non-trivial linking, which is the, just the intersection of these two non-compact cycles in the G2 and the linking of these cycles in the space time. And that's exactly the charge of this line operator uh, that under this one form symmetry. So that's sort of the electric version, and there's a magnetic version where we now take basically four cycles, there's split this two cycles in the geometry and two cycles in space time, and then wrap M5 brains now on five cycles and one cycle. So those are basically analogs of Toft lines, um, which then link uh, just in the same way as what I've written here. Okay, so one other thing, and this sort of maybe uh, answers also Drew's question from earlier. When you place these operators, UM or UE, on non-trivial cycles in space-time, that actually will correspond to inserting a fluxes, um, for the background fluxes for uh, the one-form symmetry. So it actually, space-time here could be either 5D or, or 40. So if you stick to 40 um, and we insert one of these gadgets here, that actually inserts fluxes for G4 and G7. So one way to see this is, Take again omega seven, omega seven, we split it as sigma three omega four. So there's a internal four cycle and sigma three in space time. And basically uh, these are Poincare dual to some H, H upper two in space time times now H upper two in the boundary of the geometry. And then this here is directly related to the one form symmetry. So actually what inserting one operator of this type does is actually inserting flux uh, in H2 of space time the value in the one form symmetry group. So this is essentially like turning on a background V2 field for the one form symmetry gamma one that this operator uh, was realizing. And these fluxes G4 and G7 are not commuting. So in fact, the analog of not choosing polarizations in your field theory, um, like we did in this simple SU2 case earlier, um, that's actually now the choice of finding, so commuting subset of fluxes. Right? So you can either pick just these G4s or just G7s or some uh, suitable subset thereof. And so this is the empty analog of doing that. Now, of course, these are asymptotic fluxes at the boundary of your 11 dimensional space time. So once you actually have a compact space, uh, all this discussion actually disappears, right? So this is not um, applicable. Um, so maybe this is a slightly tangential question. So uh, here one can view this choice of flux as some choice of boundary condition in M theory, no. right? But are boundary conditions in M theory completely classified? For example, uh, this- No, uh, that's of course, yes. So of course, I should make a little comment here that of course here, I'm assuming that these fluxes in M theory are also cohomology elements, which of course is not clear at all, right? So in type two, these fluxes should be classified by some kind of K theory. And I think also in M theory, probably fluxes for C3 or G4, or G7 probably have a more refined classification. So I think that's uh, uh, an open, question. Mm, I see. Really and what this. also put an M9 brain at the boundary, right? And yes, you can also, also other that. kind of thing. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. But this is like a one family of boundary conditions. Mm -hmm. 
you mean one to put the M9 brain there or you're saying this particular set? So this yeah, set so is, this is what I'm actually here focusing on is if you, for example, take a non-compact G2 and now you're, you, you're engineering a singular G2 and you're engineering essentially this way all the background, uh, you know, so B2 background fields for the possible one form symmetry that that theory has. For example, in this case here for when you're engineering pure animals. So I don't know what it is in general. Um, I think that's a good question. I, I don't think that's been uh, discussed. So Fried, Moore, Siegel uh, discuss, I think, mostly uh, string theory fluxes. So these non-commutativity of fluxes in string theory. Uh, but um, yeah, in M theory, I think that's something that's not classified to my knowledge. Okay, so this is sort of one, so th these are general considerations. What I want to now talk about is a little bit uh, focus on um, five dimensions um, and just give you a few new things that been, we've been trying to understand. Um, you know, this being CMSA, uh, uh, would be interesting to have also a discussion about uh, these insights. So, um, if you're looking at 5D, 5D is five dimensional gate series or actually conform field series um, are obtained by now compactifying M theory and Calabi L3. So everything on what I said before will also apply in that case. Uh, if the Calabi L3 actually is a canonical singularity, so it's uh, singular, but it can be resolved um, to up to sort of uh, remnant terminal singularities, uh, then the resulting five dimensional theory is a conform field theory. So I will always assume that the resolution, that a fully smooth resolution exists. Uh, this case, when you have these remnant terminal singularities, is also very interesting, but I will not talk about it today. So, what I actually is briefly the, the dictionary from 5D to geometry, um, so 5D gate theory and geometry. Uh, so the, when I consider one of these Calabi L singularities, you can resolve it to this smoothing and then ask what is the geometry that you obtain after that. So one important piece of data is compact surfaces. So compact surfaces or divisors in the Calabi L, those will precisely correspond to the cartons of the gauge theory. The non-compact divisors or just sort of take the gauge coupling which is inversely proportional to the volume to infinity. So those will be generators of the flavor symmetry algebra. And of course, if you look at the fully resolved geometry, that actually will be the Coulomb branch or in fact the extended Coulomb branch of the theory. So that's generically a U1 to the R gauge theory with a matter plus governing the low energy effective theory by a prepotential. And the prepotential is computed purely in terms of the intersection theory of these compact divisors. And then sort of on the extended Coulomb branch, you also need to take into account of these guys here. So the fully resolved Coulomb, uh, the fully resolved geometry is capturing the Coulomb branch. So that's the only thing you need to take into account. And then there are sub loci in the Coulomb branch where interesting things happen. Uh, one is the non-abelian gauge theory locus. So that's when you have one of these compact surfaces actually has the structure of a ruling. So it has a fiber rational curve, P1, that can be collapsed. Um, so it has these intersection numbers and you can collapse it and get a curve of singularities um, over the base curve sigma. So these compact surfaces, for example, a single one would then, for example, give rise to an SU2 gauge theory. If you have a collection of them and they intersect in the right way, then the intersection pattern of these fiber curves and these compact divisors gives you precisely the Cartan matrix of the gauge algebra. So geometrically, non abelian gauge theory sub loci correspond to partial singularizations. You're collapsing these fiber curves. Um, when you take the volume of these fiber curves to zero, which corresponds to basically making all the gauge bosons massless. So you have a fully, full non abelian gauge theory description, not just a U1. And then the sort of most interesting part of the, the Coulomb branch is, of course, the conform field theory points. 
And that's when you take now the volume of these compact surfaces to zero, meaning the gauge couplings go to infinity. So these are the UV fixed points that can be described in terms of these singular uh, Calabi-Hau geometries. So in the geometry, the canonical singularity is the SCFT locus. Okay, so what are now the symmetries of the theory? I said the gauge algebra is encoded essentially in the compact divisors, but there's a, there's a question of what's actually the gauge group. And then there's flavor symmetry. And again, the question is what's the compact gauge uh, group? So what you obtain from the geometry, at least in this naive way, is the algebra. And you need to do a little bit more work to actually extract so more global data. And for this, so one important input is to calculate the spectrum of line operators, so compute one form symmetry, and then actually much more fundamentally to define what I'll do in a moment, define the structure group of the theory. So one symmetry group is so one of the, so in five dimensions, uh, we, we have, of course, line operators. They're characterized by the one form symmetry, the charge under one form symmetry group. When you gauge a one form symmetry, um, you actually go to a two form symmetry. So those are the sort of, um, electromagnetic doors. Um, and I'll focus on these two things. So also 5D CFTs, both three form symmetry, uh, which we will not discuss today. Okay, so what are, what, what are the properties of these, these one form symmetries in 5D theories? Well, we can have, uh, just from the point of view of the non be engaged theory, already some idea of what's going on. So we have always the center symmetry of the gauge group, modulo screening, and the screening now can happen by just matter, but also instanton particles. So in 5D, we have instanton particles that can also be charged under the center symmetry. So for example, SU2, uh, SUN with transimance level zero, will have the full center symmetry. But if I to have a non-trivial uh, transformers level K, uh, that actually gets broken to the GCD of N and K because now I have a charged K particle uh, that was partially screened this. And more generally, the center symmetry will be broken by matter depending on the charge of the matter. So for example, for SUN, the fundamental is charged one under the center, so it kills the full center symmetry. For SU4, we have a Z4, and if I add an anti-symmetric, it will break it to Z2, which is a subgroup of the center symmetry. So that's very much like in four dimensions um, from gauge theory. So one thing I would like to do is just briefly recap how the one form symmetry actually is computed in these 5D theories. So that's actually you know, relatively old, but there's a slight catch to this, and we'll get to the interesting part in a moment. So in 5D, the one form symmetry is like in this general discussion earlier, computed in terms of now relative homology of the Calabi-Yau with respect to its boundary modulo, um, the compact, so non-compact two cycles, modulo compact two cycles. And this being sort of a really nice algebraic geometry framework, actually this object, this quotient can just be computed in terms of intersection theory on the Calabi L. So the compact divisors uh, SI basically, uh, there are B4 many of these, and then there are compact curves in the Calabi L and there are B2 many. And it's relatively straightforward to show that this quotient here can be computed by taking the matrix, this intersection matrix of compact surfaces and compact curves and just quotienting the lattice z to the b4 by m times z to b2. That's in fact computing the one form symmetry of that. And in practice, this is some integer matrix and it has a nice sort of integral change of basis uh, using the Smith normal form, um, which is just sort of some diagonal of uh, lambda one, lambda n um, uh, entries. And those then, the Z mod lambda I are then the one form symmetry um, factors of this theory. So let's look at the simplest possible geometry. Uh, it's SU20, it's the Cybrex theory E1. This is, if you're so inclined, the toric diagram for it. It's just an F2 
Hilton growth surface, which is P1 fibroid over P1. The curve, so there's a fiber curve and a base curve. They have the intersection numbers E squared is minus two, S squared is zero, E dot F is one. And now I can compute the intersection between the surface F2 with all its curves. And that gives us the matrix zero comma two. And so indeed the one form symmetry is just Z2. So that's from the geometry, a way of just extracting the correct one form symmetry that you would see from the gauge theory. Okay, uh, so, so so far- so, To clarify, yeah. so for SU2 theory, uh, one cannot add the usual transcendence uh, form, right? That is true. Uh, so I should really but, write theta uh, angle, yeah. Right, um, but, but for SU2 uh, with a non-trivial theta angle- uh, Then it's one, trivial. Again, oh, okay, so it's- uh, Then it is trivial, yes. That's right. So it's really important theta here. Right? This is indeed the should I should say that equals to zero. So, but I will actually focus on this one because it actually has a, a one form symmetry, and so I think that's probably the, the right framework to now expand this further. And basically, all of these geometric computations will reproduce what you expect from, if you have a gauge theory description, they will reproduce the gauge theory uh, one form symmetry. In 5D, of course, what can happen is that your uh, Calabiao geometry gives you a CFT that doesn't actually have um, a gauge theory description. So there could be um, CFTs that do not have loci in the Kumo bands where you get a gauge theory. And nevertheless, you can compute the one form symmetry for these theories. Um, so, you know, on the Coulomb branch and then uh, also on the single locus. Okay, um, right. So, the SU2 zero theory has basically um, not just this gauge group SU2, but it also has, and, and the one form symmetry is E2, uh, but it also has a flavor symmetry. And then the UV uh, that's enhanced from, a, from the IR. Uh, that uh, you want to uh, the flavor symmetry, I'm going to be somewhat cautious uh, to write just the algebra SU2. So that's sort of the SU2 algebra um, that you get from the geometry. And one way of seeing that is basically um, from this toric diagram that there's a minus two curve sitting here. And that will be the thing that uh, will be responsible for the flavor symmetry in SU2. Now, what I would like to ask first is what actually is the global form of the flavor symmetry group? Can we determine this from looking at uh, this geometric setting? So the geometry is actually not just, so so far we looked at this F2, the compact surface, but actually um, there's more going on in this Calabiao geometry. There's also a non-compact divisor and this non-compact divisor is responsible for this rank one flavor symmetry. And that's sort of what hits this toric, this uh, sort of another toric non-compact divisor that hits basically at this locus here. So in terms of just the surface geometries, there's an F2 compact surface, and then there's a non-compact surface. It's also of the structure that it has a P1 vibration, um, over now just a non-compact curves of say C. And these two are glued here we have this E curve, this is the base E curve, and this is glued against this F curve here, which is the fiber curve, the non-compact divisor. So this line just means these two guys are glued at the over P1, and that P1 is in this case the E curve, and here it's the fiber curve. And so now to actually compute the intersections um, of both E and F curves in this compact surface, um, we would like to not just compute them for this gauge, divisor, so F2 dot E, F2 dot F, but also the flavor symmetry. So this flavor non-compact divisor. And that actually tells us there are sort of, um, you know, additional entries in the table. So far we looked at this, now we get this additional piece here. An interesting observation that, I, so, you know, it's sort of mildly interesting, and I think this is the source of what I'm going to tell you momentarily about the more refined properties of this is that this curve here, this gauge boson, so this is 
The gauge boson charged under the C1 is actually also charged under the flavor symmetry. Okay, so before we actually proceed, it's now important to actually get down to a bit more, you know, refined, so, so define a few more things and actually sort of uh, make sure that uh, here we were somewhat casual. We were talking very often about flavor symmetry, uh, flavor symmetry algebra. In fact, um, we would like to actually understand what is the group structure. So I, I would like to sort of say uh, that we define a, an object, the structure group of the theory, and that's basically all the symmetries that act faithfully on everything in the theory, all the matter in the theory. So that's formally the gauge group times F, F is the simply connected cover. So if the gauge algebra was SUN, it would be the SUN group. You pick the simply connected group, but then modulo a subgroup E, and this E lives in uh, the product of the two centers, ZG times the F. So the centers of G and the center of F. So this object here, is defined as being the actual symmetry, the structure grouping, every, every generator in there acts non-trivially on the matter. There's no, no generator that sort of acts trivially. And in this formulation, one way of now characterizing what the one form symmetry is, is it's precisely all the guys in E that are of the form, some non-trivial entry inside ZG comma zero. Right? It's not the projection, but actually the, the, uh, the, the subset of elements in E of this form. And then the global form of the flavor symmetry is now basically the, the part that sort of projects so that, that reduces F. So that's now I take E and I take the projection onto the factor F, and the factor that lives in ZF and quotient that group Z out of the simply connected version of F. So from E, and I'll compute E from the geometry, we will then determine the global form of the flavor symmetry in this way. Okay, so this is sort of the slightly more, maybe you might think it's slightly, you know, why are you doing this? Well, I'll tell you why this is sort of, it's sort of useful to do this. Um, so the first thing to notice for this SU20 theory, now we said this is, these are the two, the compact, non-compact generators. These are the U1 charges under D. Again, I can put this into Smith's normal form. And I find that it's now has these diagonal general factor Z4, and this gives a trivial factor. So this determines now what is this group E, right? So this is basically what will be modded out from this group that's now in, on the Coulomb branch, U1 gauge times U1 flavor. So E here is Z4, and this Z4 needs now be embedded into the two centers, the centers here, because you're on the Coulomb branch, the two U1 groups. And the way it's embedded is in terms of the generator one quarter, one half in R mod Z times R mod Z. So that's, the structure group. Note, if you had thought the gauge bosons are not charged under this flavor symmetry, under this flavor generator, then in fact, this would be Z2 times Z2, and you would just get E is the structure group Z2 times Z2, which embeds as Z2 times Z2 into either U1, 1 or U1F. But the key point here is that you actually get the Z4. And the way that now the one form symmetry is realized is we said it's the it's the elements inside E that have to form some non trivial entry, comma zero. So this is pure inside ZG. So those are precisely the generators one half zero. So twice the generator of that. And now this group Z, which is just a projection of E onto ZF, is generated by this half. So that's also Z two. Another interesting point here is that these groups participate now in this sort of short, nice short exact sequence. So this group E is now a Z4 and it's an extension of Z2, uh, which projects to another Z2, okay? So the flavor symmetry 
on this Coulomb branch is given by u1 f mod z, z is z2. So we actually find this is now u1 f over z2. And now if we lift this to away from the Coulomb branch to the, to the CFT point, this actually the z2 quotient remains and we now get the SU2 simply connected over z2. So the flavor symmetry is SO3. So that's the flavor, the co uh, compact version of the flavor symmetry. Oop. Um, for the theory with SU2 gauge group. Are there any questions about this? I kind of didn't get any more questions. Are there any, is anyone? Uh, uh, so can you remind us what is the geometry uh, to get um, this theory and also the theory with non sure theta angle? Ah, so, so for SU2 zero, you have this geometry here. So in fact, you might know it uh, in a slightly different form as just P1 times P1. This is totally equivalent to this geometry that I've drawn here, right? So it's essentially um, uh, the a local Calabiao, which has one compact divisor, um, which is P1 times P1. And this is just a slightly different uh, point in the complex structure where you actually see this SU2 flavor symmetry algebra. Uh -huh. okay. And P1 times P1 is the base of the uh, elliptic vibration or? Ah, uh, no, so, okay. Um, you can also realize all of these things. Okay, so that's, that's, a, that's a slightly different question. So let me add to the other. So you can also, this is not, this is dangerous. Now you take me to favorite topic of elliptic vibrations, but you uh, asked the question. <laughs> this until the end, if you want to. No, so um, you can also generate all of these. So the rank, sorry, the rank one EN theories or ENF plus one theories, which are SU2 plus NF fundamentals, NF less than or equal to seven. Um, you can realize all of them also starting with the E string geometry in 60. And so that's basically an elliptic model um, with. Uh, so you have a T2 fiber, um, and actually it has uh, an E8 singularity collided with an I1 singularity, right? And then basically you can do, this is a non, what's called a non-flat resolution, and then you get one compact. So this is the compact surface S1, and that could be a generalized or petzl surface, okay? So what I'm describing here is only the surface. So in fact, a lot of this information about properties of these series, you can extract just from the geometry of the low of the surfaces themselves. So another way of saying it is there's a non-compact Calabial where the toric diagram of this uh, Calabial is just given in terms of this. It's a Calabial threefold, it's a non-compact Calabial threefold with this toric diagram. Um, and if you put M theory on it and you fully you, you don't resolve it, you leave it singular, you're generating the uh, e, SU2 zero theory. And now you can, there are, some of these are toric, uh, I think until um, NF equals to two or three, um, but this is the slightly more general framework where you can just start with the elliptic vibration in 60 and then you you actually from this, from the, from this uh, F theory model, in M theory, right, to compactify M theory on this elliptic vibration, you can then obtain by flops the full set of, uh, you know, ENF theories. So that's sort of just a geometric realization of these things in terms of elliptic models. I was now doing this just in terms of the geometry. But one point that also emerges here that you need to, right, to actually see the full uh, symmetry group, you actually need to, um, incorporate also these non-compact divisors. So that information is actually quite important to get the correct sort of charges under all the symmetries. Yeah, so thanks this, for the detailed answer. Okay. Any other questions about the structure group or any of that? No. Okay, so this, so it gives us the basically the the uh, uh, 
flavor symmetry, a way of computing from dramatic input, the global form of the flavor symmetry. And this way of, you know, understanding this from this intersection data is a very general framework, kind of final to all your 5D models. Um, one of the questions which we went and asked ourselves is, so given that we now have zero models with zero and one form symmetries, um, can we pick arbitrary backgrounds for these in uh, these compactification? So we are secretly asking the question, do these things actually really form two independent groups, symmetry groups, or is there actually a higher group structure? Right? So that was sort of the question we were trying to uh, understand. And so this is work in progress, so, and we'd be happy to get feedback on this uh, particular uh, part of the talk. Uh, on the whole part of the talk, but this in particular. So we said we have, this is the structure group, the gauge group, the flavor symmetry, and then there's this group that's sort of the, the, the group that acts trivially on all the matter, this is the Z4. The flavor symmetry on the Kluman branch for this SU2 zero theory is U1F not Z2, and the one form symmetry is Z2. And these participate, these groups, in this short exact sequence. So the first thing you would want to do is, is to now ask when I turn on a background for the one form symmetry, um, what does this actually correspond to? And first I will not turn on a background for the zero form symmetry. So the one form symmetry background as we've now discussed several times is a two form uh, and it's Z2 value for this theory. And what it means is once we turn this on, we actually gauge the center symmetry. So the gauge bundles for this theory are now actually G mod gamma one bundles. So they have an obstruction to being lifted to G bundles. So in our case, it's one over Z two, uh, and there's an obstruction which is characterized by some characteristic class W two of lifting this to to G bundles. And in quite general terms, right, the backgrounds B2 are then precisely these default Whitney classes W2. So that's just turning on to one form symmetry background. Now, if you also have a zero form symmetry, you can ask, well, can I do this at the same time? So if I, in addition, turn on a, a, one for, a zero form symmetry background, so for the flavor symmetry F, so it's a one form A1. I'm, I'm looking at now bundles that are these map, this F plus U1, F mod Z2 in this particular instance. And those are now bundles which have an obstruction to be lifted to U1, F bundles. So those have again some characters class, which is V2, which is now a Z2 value, where the Z2 is this group, um, this Z. And in fact, by turning these on, the gauge bundles also, right? You remember the structure group is this, the gauge bundles are also now not generically U1 gauge bundles, but actually U1 mod Z4 bundles with some obstruction to lifting them to U1 mod Z2 bundles. So in fact, by turning on this sort of V2, I'm also, I did most of what can happen is I can turn on the same V2 for also the gauge bundles. And so now if I have this sort of setup, in addition, I want to now turn on a one form symmetry background, then in fact, right, as we said earlier, this will actually be an obstruction to lifting U1 uh, mod Z2 bundles to U1 bundles. Um, but in fact, by having this V2 turned on, um, you may not actually be able to turn W2 on. So basically what this is saying is, because these groups, actually aren't just, or this, this group in the middle, this group E isn't just a product. Um, you may have an obstruction to actually uh, turning on backgrounds for the one form symmetry and also uh, these obstructions uh, V2 for the zero form symmetry, right? And so what I'll define is turning on a class that takes values in Z4. And so in this way, sort of you're actually not free depending on whether this this, so, okay. Depending on whether uh, these classes are actually non-trivial, um, you are not free to actually turn on uh, different backgrounds, V2, W2, independently from each other. And the way to actually realize that you now have sort of this extension 
uh, class that you can actually uh, turn on this in terms of beta tenders. W2 is now not actually a closed co-chain, but actually it's, it's sort of, it has co-boundaries, it's not trivial. Um, and that's given in terms of the boxing of V2. And so the boxing, right? So we have the short exact sequence. And so V2 lives in here. So in cohomology, there's an associated long exact sequence. And now the boxing is exactly, it's not the maps us to H3. With values in gamma one. And so if this is non-trivial, then you would say there's a two group in this theory. So in this case, this may be, a, in fact, this is sort of right. So this, co this construction works quite generally. Um, and in four dimensions, this was implemented by Sin and Lam and for- Excuse me, so, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. my new question, uh, similar to this slide or, may, or maybe earlier slide also fine. Yeah. Maybe one more slide earlier. Yeah. I just want to make sure whether the Z2 and Z21, this zero and one-point symmetry, do they have an anomaly or do they have a- ah, th That's a good question. So that's on the Coulomb branch, they do not. So uh, my discussion here is actually on the Coulomb branch. Now, the, uh, uh, Luigi and Pietro have conjectured once you take actually U1 instant on U1 and then actually consider that and that sort of enhances nice you and so on. There could be an anomaly and this is some matter of discussion at the moment, I think. So on the Coulomb branch, the answer is there is no anomaly between these two symmetries. Okay. And, so and in fact, you could also gauge, you could also gauge this and then you would see there's now a mixed anomaly between the zero and two form symmetry. Uh, okay. Does it suggest that the instant symmetry is also part of uh, this two group symmetry? Yeah. If it's turned on, yeah, then. So, um... Yes, I knew this, these questions would come. So here, here's the deal. I'm only talking, so here I'm fully on the Coulomb branch. And I'll say something about how this will work on the, at the SCFT point. And, and it seems really that here the instant on symmetry does participate in that because it's really the thing that will enhance them. So this is actually part of this slide here. And on the SCFT point, this U1F should be replaced with SO3F. Um, and then V2 is basically the obstruction to lifting that to SU2 bundles, right? So that would suggest, right, once you go to the specific sublocals where you have the non be engaged to a low symmetry, uh, that you then actually would have the instant on symmetry participate in that. But I'm not willing to commit to that because I think there's still something more subtle going on on the non and gauge locus. So what I'm talking about um, is, yeah. I am confused by one thing you said. So how come anomaly can depend on branch, uh, you know, the, 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 or phase? It should be independent of that, I thought. Absolutely, yes, yes. I'm only saying that it, of course, but the anomaly should, of course, right? If there's an anomaly, it should always be there. Um, what I'm saying is I can derive it on the Coulomb branch and I have a full understanding of what's going on in the Coulomb branch. Right? Oh, okay. So yeah. That's all I'm saying. So there are certain things on the, uh, if you go to special sub low side that you might have to take into account in addition. So for example, what is the relation between the U1F I've been talking about with the U1 in Santon that you would write down mm -hmm. for the engaged theory, right? So that relation needs to be worked out and one needs to be careful about this. And then I would expect that also to be there. So I, okay. I absolutely with, I agree with what you're saying and just saying that I'm not committing that I can derive the same effect at this point from the non being engaged your locus. Thanks. Okay, cool. Um, I know Luigi and Peter are there. You will probably have a comment. I would actually like the anomaly between the zero one form symmetry discussion to be postponed to the end of the talk because I think we would otherwise just end up discussing that. And what I think is important though is one needs to check that these things are always non-trivial. And I think it, it, they, these, these groups here, these will be non-trivial once you actually go to the, um, to the, sorry, to, to the SO, to the, to the SDFT point, uh, the BSO3, um, box teams. And one other comment is if you gauge the one form symmetry, then actually uh, you go to the, if, if it's anomaly free, um, the zero and one form symmetry don't have a mixed anomaly, you could gauge this and then you would see a mixed two form 
symmetry, zero form symmetry anomaly. So there's a B3 background that um, talks to this uh, boxing of B2. Okay. This can be generalized. I will not bother you with this, but my, the same sort of way, at least on the level of that there are these non-trivial extensions um, that actually propagates through to other theories. And that's something that we currently uh, writing up. At the one sort of uh, sufficient condition to have this non-trivial sort of extent or to at least have the chance of getting these two groups is that E is, is basically uh, projects to the ZG factor um, uh, injectively. So it actually is uh, isomorphic to the image of E under this projection. And also that the sequence doesn't split. So if the sequence splits, you will not have a boxing, of course. Okay, but the key point that I think is sort of even for this two group, but also for the global form of the flavor symmetry is that by actually being a bit more careful about defining what the structure group is. And that's really relying on input from the geometry. Um, that then gives you all this information. So these are not just effective filtering arguments. These are really things that come from the geometry. Computing this group E is really intimately tied to actually computing, to, to knowing the intersection theory in this geometry. Okay, so I think this brings me to, yeah, to the end of part one, and I'm actually not out of time yet, but so is there any question about part one or comments? Uh, just one comment yes, Luigi, or yes. question. Yes. So is one, so if I understand correctly, one new point is that this SU2 theory uh, should yeah. really have SO3 global symmetry group. That is right. So I think, that's one of your new points. Well, I mean, I don't know how new it is because uh, as you pointed out, that Kim Kim Lee predicted this from their index some time ago. Now, basically by looking at this form, actually looking at this full intersection uh, uh, matrix, you really see that this is a Z4 and then you actually see the projection to Z2. So you get this quotient, yes. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so. Now this is consistent with your anomaly, but this does not yet, and I don't want to do the discussion now. We will, we will switch off the video and then we'll have a long discussion about this. I'd be happy to do that. But um, this is consistent with the anomaly, but it, as, it assumes that this U1i is tied, in what way it's tied to the U1 instanton, that's still this, the question, right? So no, this but... is a computation on purely the Kuhlman branch that I'm doing. I just want to make a point. Maybe it's also connected to the comment by me taught before. Yeah. If we just stick to the gauge theory, so not the super conformal field theory, yeah. there is no, I don't think there's any doubt that there is an anomaly between the instant on symmetry and the, and the one form symmetry. So, so I agree with me thought. Uh, that is true, yeah. unless there is another sector in the theory that would actually cancel the anomaly and it doesn't actually extend to the UV, right? So you could have a theory that has an anomaly and another sector that provides a contribution to the same, right? it, it basically saturates an anomaly and then the theory in the UV doesn't have an anomaly. Sakura, do you mean that there is uh, another sector of there is another symmetry will, which mixes? Uh, or... So I'm not talking about the anomaly at all. Okay, so I, I've not even mentioned the zero and one form symmetry mixed anomaly. All I'm saying is here, there's even on the Coulomb branch, in the, on the Coulomb branch, I have a complete calculation of control. And it's, it's coming still from this M theory construction, but it actually is really there's there's no ambiguity I think. Mm -hmm. There I see that if you want to turn on backgrounds for the zero and the one form symmetry, for a theory that has a zero and one form symmetry, sometimes you may have an obstruction to just turn on arbitrary backgrounds, right? You, there may be because certain, this group here E isn't just a product group that fits into G and to F, but as an extension, it is possible that you are forced to actually turn on a background that actually is um, sort of correlates these two forms a two group. 
right? So this is on the Coulomb bound, and I think this is basically what I think all I have said. Sure. Now, there has been a long discussion about the 0-1 form symmetry mixed anomaly, and we will postpone the discussions of that to the end of the talk. I'm really happy to do it, but not now, in about 45 minutes. Okay, so I want to now completely shift gears and tell you something that's sort of um, perhaps slightly different, but it's the same theme and you will see many of these sort of same ideas recurring. And that's sort of how we realize quantum field theories in um, string theory is holographic uh, duals to uh, theories of gravity. And basically there's so really the, the, the first instance, I think this was discussed was in written in the end of the nineties uh, for ADS5 and then for ADS4 recently, Oren, Yuji and Gabi had this paper um, refining aspects of um, you know, ABJM theories, all the global forms of that by studying boundary conditions in ADS CFT. Um, what I wanna discuss is basic application to another holographic setup where you don't have conformal field theory tools, but actually tools to confine them. And you might think it's not completely disconnected, but you'll see a lot of similar things reappearing uh, conceptually. So this is, uh, you know, if you, are, if you think this is, these are two talks, they're really still intertwined. Okay, so to sort of set the scene, I just need to explain a little bit how this works for ADS5 or in some other more holographic setting that you're familiar with. Um, so let's pick ADS5 times X5, dual to either N equals four super young mills or an N equals one superconform field theory, and just look at five form fluxes. So this is really the most vanilla holographic setting you could think of. And then the dual for S5, for example, is just SUN algebra super young mills. And so now the question, the theme of this talk is how do you distinguish the global forms of the gauge theory and also how do you determine the one form symmetries? And the important thing that basically was pointed out by Witten in, in the 90s was, well, you need to look at Turn Simon's terms. Of course, he was talk not talking about the one form symmetry, but yeah. anyway, he was. So you need to look at the Turn Simon's term in type to be supergravity, which is F5, so the five form flux, um, the, sorry, the five form uh, that also appears here in the flux, B2 wedge DC2. So the NS and S2 form and the R2 form. They participate in this top one here. And if I now reduce this along the five sphere or X5 more generally, um, I get a five dimensional supergravity that basically has, now if I study just the fluctuations of B2 and C2 is to a five D topological term N times B2 DC2. So formally it comes from just integrating over this, but actually what you should really do is do the truncation to the five dimensional theory and look at all the couplings that this gauge supergravity has. And one of these couplings is this. There are many more other terms, but this is the leading term in terms of derivative expansion. And so that's the one that's relevant uh, close to the boundary. And so just studying now this 5D topological term, you see that now this says that the B2 and C2 are actually ZN gauge fields, not both Z, ZN two form fields, sorry, the two form fields. And so we can actually use them to construct topological surface operators by just forming these combinations here. And what also written shows is that they actually have a not the fluxes, the, the B2 and C2 have a non commutativity when you canonically quantize B and C. And so in fact, these two operators have an exchange relation that picks up a phase that depends now on both the surface intersection, so the intersection number geometrically, but also this one over n factor that comes from the non-commutativity of the fluxes. So this basically gives you a set of surface operators that don't commute. Um, now, the way we can think about line operators is to take surfaces that now end on the boundary and say, for example, we look at the UB surfaces ending on the boundary of ADS, um, so they give rise to line operators at the boundary. So these are fundamental strings ending on the boundary. So those are Wilson lines. They will actually have a non-trivial uh, linking with the uh, UC 
closed surface operators. And so those are the charge operators and vice versa. The UC with boundaries will be the top lines and then the UBs would be the charge operators. So what to, to formalize this, what I have to do is to study boundary conditions for these kinds of um, topological couplings. And so in ADS5 times S5, for example, we have this here. So we can, for example, take B2 Dirichlet, C2 Neumann, then the F1 strings end on the boundary, and then the UC2 are the topological operators linking. And we can see also from sort of more string theoretic considerations that in fact, this B2, um, these line operators are screened and the screen is precisely by N uh, by looking at sort of the Bianchi identities for the F7. So F7 couples to the D5 brains. And if I take the Bianchi identity for F7, you get DF7 is F5 or H3. So integrating this now over the S5, I pick up an N times H3. And so this is saying that the wrap D5s on the S5 will have to have N strings ending on them. And so the, the, the so-called variant vertex screens these N Wilson lines. And we can study many other boundary conditions. So there are, of course, the sort of analog wave switch B and C. Um, and then there are also, of course, more general boundary conditions when you have, say, N is P times Q. And then essentially you pick your gauge sort of SUN mod ZQ. And then you have sort of the this barren vertex is then realized in terms of sort of PQ5 brains and the screening as of the QP strings. So that's ADS5. And now what I want to do is um, apply this insight how to see line operators and also one form symmetries at the boundary of holographic space times to a setup that was studied around 2000 and um, wildly, uh, which is this sort of dual to confinement. And of course, confinement has intimate relations with one form symmetry. So that seems a, a suitable setup to actually uh, study uh, one form symmetries holographically. So let's just recap uh, what that setup is. So we start with something that's still sort of a, CFT, ADS CFT setup, we have these three brains probing the conifold. So the conifold is just a very simple hypersurface singularity uh, given here. And that's a conical Calabiao space. And the link of this cone is what's called T11. So it's a cone of a T11. This is topologically just S3 times S2. Or T11 is this quotient here of the two groups, S2 times S2 over U1. And the, this gives sort of this, these three brains probing the conifold geometry. That's basically um, just a CFT setup. So the ADS5 times T11, that's dual to a CFT, that's an angles one CFT. You have five form flux. Um, sorry, wrong understood. Now, the point about constructing duals to confinement is at D5 brains on a two sphere. So on this two sphere that you have in this conifold, and what this actually entails in the solution is that now the S3 will take a finite size and actually won't shrink even at the tip of the cone to zero volume, but the flux will actually um, sort of force it to be finite size. So geometrically you get the deformation, the deformed conifold at the bottom of this uh, conical shaped geometry. And so this is, not conical anymore. Uh, it is actually now dual to a uh, confining or conjectured to be dual to confining theory. And the solution is basically this uh, Klebanov Strassler solution. And the ra there's a radial direction which is going out here. And this radial direction has this logarithmic behavior. Um, so this function, so this R function here has this logarithmic behavior. I won't bore you with all the details of the solution, but basically the way to think about the solution is at large values of R, um, you're far away, you basically have this T11, this conifold this sort of solution, that's in the UV. And as you approach small values of R, at some point you see the IR and you should see this um, uh, uh, confining theory. One peculiarity of the solution is that the fluxes depend on this radial direction. Uh, as some continuous functions, some logs of this radial variable. And so 
basically only for very specific values of this radial direction do you actually get the integral fluxes. So these are these values are k and at these points you have integral b2 flux and f5 flux and then you can ask so what's the dual field theory uh, at dual, or what's the field theory at the slice uh, r plus rk. And one uh, particular interesting point is, of course, that the, this k of r, which counts, so to say, the, the five form flux, that actually along this flow from large r to small r actually decreases. So k is n and then starts as n and then goes to n minus k times n uh, as you go along this OG flow. And so the question is so, what is the dual field theory? Uh, the dual field theory is this uh, duality cascade. Um, if you've not seen this, you won't learn it from here, but the basic essence is you will start with something that's a curver. So you have in the standard T11, you would have just N gauge nodes to gauge nodes with some bi fundamental matter. And by adding the five brains, M five brains, you actually get a gauge of SUN plus M times SUN. And along this, so at, this is in the UV, and now we go along this RG flow. And this becomes strongly coupled along this flow. And at some point, this coupling diverges, at which point, in fact, what you have here is actually SUN plus N with two N flavors. You can do a cyber duality, and actually that's dual to SU2N, SUN minus N plus two N flavors. And then when you, that's sort of the theory at the first sort of integral value or k, k goes to one. And so that's the dual field theory description. And then you continue along the flow and then this becomes strongly coupled. You do a cyber duality and then the next one becomes, and you keep doing this until you reach the very end. And if M actually divides N, you end up with pure SUM superangular theory. So that's, why this should be a dual to uh, a confining theory. So actually the conjecture is this is dual to a confining vacuum of pure superangular theory. Okay, so we assume that N is K times M, so we get at the end of this flow an SUM. And- you should, I have yeah. a question. Mm -hmm. uh, is that the, the final theory that you, you get to the pure Young-Mills? The one- Is what? Yeah, the it's pure, pure N equals pure. one Young-Mills, yes. Yes. Uh, can a theory have set up, set up term the way you induce? Uh, yes, so there could be a lot of different refinements, which I don't think, uh, so maybe they are studied, I don't know. So one, one, for example, question is, can you actually have, before you even go to the theta terms, right? Can you actually, for example, have different global forms of this gauge group and duals to that? Might that, that's even before you add more things, there, there's a question, could you do that? And that generalization, I think also is, is actually uh, not been studied. Okay, thanks. So indeed, at the end, we, we actually uh, expect to the, the conjecture at the time is, or there was a lot of evidence that this theory at the end is actually a confining vacuum of pure young mills. Um, so when we read this now from sort of this one form symmetry point of view, uh, what's our expectation? As I said, there should be an unbroken one form symmetry. And also uh, what I'd like to uh, also explain from the supergravity point of view is um, that we can understand the full chiral symmetry breaking using sort of a more uh, sort of one form symmetry informed uh, way, namely using anomalies um, in this context. So basically these two points, which of course at the time uh, had been discussed, but not in this, this particular, from this particular point of view, um, I would like to discuss now. So I hope to be done in about 10 minutes and uh, then I'm already five minutes over, but let me- Take, take your time, take your time, don't worry. Okay, um, so the, the, the thing we learned from this simple ADS five times this five example is we need to look at the topological couplings in the supergravity theory. So for this duality cascade, this top stress solution, and um, for most part of this cascade, the, the solution is actually T11. Uh, so we need to know what is actually the 5D effective supergravity action 
on T11. Um, and that gauge supergravity actually this consistent truncation was computed in Cassani and Faedo. And what we actually need to extract is the topological terms that can appear in this action. Um, there's several other terms which I'll discuss in a moment that are interesting for the problem of Carl symmetry breaking. So the, there are fluctuations of the NSNS3 form, that's H3 for or the RR3 form, and then a part of the decomposition of the phi form along a two sphere that's called F3. And all of these have these equations of motion, which come from a topological coupling that's B2, so the NSNS2 form wedged with n times g3 minus m times f3. So this is the analog uh, of what we had in ADS5 of b2 dc2. So the topological 5D topological action that should inform now what kind of one-form symmetries and so on we can have in the setup uh, is this column here. And I'll just denote this here as math cal c. And to read off the one-form symmetries, again, we studied the boundary conditions and that goes completely analogous to what I explained to you in the ADS5 setting. So from, for example, one set of boundary conditions is B2 is Dirichlet. So we have again, fundamental strings ending on the boundary or on these slices, RK, um, and the C is Neumann. So then B2 is actually a GCD and M, one, a two form field. So the one form symmetry will be uh, GCD and comma M and the fundamental strings are the Wilson lines. And again, we can sort of think of this one form symmetry, this the, the design operators um, and the screening in terms of the uh, Bianchi's in this particular supergravity solution. So we can look at the Bianchi's for uh, basically F7 integrated over T, the full T11 or F5 integrated over part of the T11, the S3. So these correspond to wrapped D3 bands uh, or the five brains. And in fact, uh, this should be the opposite. Anyway. So again, this combination, so this says when you want to integrate them, you get these fluxes integrating to n minus kn. So this comes from the Bianchi identities here and here. And so what this says is that that many fundamental strings will be screened and the minimal configuration is exactly GCD and comma M. So that confirms again the, what you see from this topological coupling. So that's nice, but what's actually nicer is now to discuss really the, how the whole, you know, how we actually see this confinement uh, story arise in this, mm, so the, from this one from the point of view. Um, so in this solution, there's, to start with, we have a U1 R symmetry in the UV, but actually, and that's geometrically realized as the re vector of this uh, T11 geometry. And this is U1 uh, uh, vibration. Um, in the field theory, we know this U1 R symmetry for pure young moles is broken to Z2M. So this is for SUM, uh, Z2M, um, to Z2M by this ABJ anomaly. And one question you can ask, how do you see this also from the supergravity point of view? And in the society consistent truncation, there is indeed a, super, there's a term which is like a Stuckelberg coupling between this U1R symmetry gauge field A and an axion. So the axion is C0 and G1 is DC0. So the axion has a shift symmetry. And then in the, like in the standard Stuckelberg kind of mechanism, you can now basically gauge this away um, except there is sort of a remnant Z2M, so this is this 2M here, that's still a symmetry of the zero. And so what used to be this U1 actually becomes now a Z2M, a zero form symmetry. So this comes from one coupling in this 5D supergravity. And then there's another coupling, which is uh, interesting now from the point of view of uh, the uh, higher form symmetries. So there's a coupling between B2, B2, and A1, so A1 is again, now this Z2M zero form symmetry background and B2 is the NS and NS2 form. So that's the one form symmetry background. And this coupling is precisely an anomaly now between the zero form and the one form symmetry. So you have a ZM gauge field. So this is basically at the end. So here I'm assuming again that M uh, GCD M comma N is just 
m, I see that at the end of this uh, flow. So they're basically just multiples of each other. And so what you actually get here is now a mix normally between these two symmetries, which of course, right, it's a really the important thing in this whole supergravity from this consistent occasion you get is this all the bells and whistles and all the normalizations. So the point is this anomaly needs to be actually integral to this omega. Because otherwise you won't have any way of saturating uh, it with some kind of TQFT. So if you have a, a confining vacuum, then you want to retain the one form symmetry. B2 wedge B2 is basically point three eigen square B2 that's even on spin manifolds. So in fact, if you want the Z1 M1 form symmetry unbroken, then in order to actually get this to be an integral, you need the periods of A to be multiples of M times C. So uh, multiples of M, uh, integral multiples of M. So what you actually get is that what used to be the Z2 M field is now actually becomes broken to Z2 zero form symmetry. And that's precisely sort of the effect of what this anomaly does also in the field theory. But the nice thing is here, you can actually recover it also from a purely supergravity analysis. Uh, from the 5D uh, gauge to the gravity point of view. Uh, okay. so, Sakura? Yeah. Sorry. Can I ask a question? Sure, sure, yes. Hi, Yifan. So, so where, where does this, uh, yeah, hi. Uh, so, uh, where does this B2 wedge, B2 wedge A1 term come from in a 10 dimensional supergravity? This is not a 10 dimensional supergravity coupling. All the couplings that I'm writing down here, these mm -hmm. here, these here, sorry, these all come from a consistent truncation of the supergravity on the compactification space, on the T11 space, right? So this is like in five dimensions, so in the eight is five times is five. Yes. Five D, so this is really here, I should really write M5, I'm writing M5 because space time isn't anymore eight is five, but it's the same as the coupling, like in these, this B2 wedge DC2 that came mm -hmm. from 10 dimensional, M5 yes. wedge B2 wedge DC2. You integrate yes. essential Y5, but actually what you really should be doing is looking at the full consistent truncation, right? So mm -hmm. this is a coupling in the full, the consistent truncated supergravity to five dimension. I see, but uh, somehow Witten didn't consider this term in his original work. Witten did not consider this term because I don't think Witten at the time knew about T11 nor the duality, nor this confining duality cascade, right? So this is I a see. term that appears precisely in, so Witten studies only ADS holography, right? So that, that mm -hmm. discussion that I was doing is an ADS holography discussion. Um, but, but, but you say it has to do with the geometry of the internal space, right? S5 versus T11. That's why in one case, you just have the BD, BDC, B2C, DC2. The other That's case, right. you have this B2, That's B2A1. Right. I see. Now, right, there is a difference between just taking the type to B supergravity action and integrating over the internal space and then what you do, mm -hmm. right? Here, mm -hmm. this action, I really would like to think of as the action of all the fluctuations in this supergravity, right, that basically comes from the consistent truncation. So everything, all these uh, XIT, all these fluctuations are still modes, and you really get information of the effective action in 5D. It's not just a statement about reducing it, right? So right, but, but it's a bit surprising because B2 watch B2 watch A1 is, is actually more leading in this derivative expansion. So you would have expected it to come from some leading term and it's just integral, right? Well, I mean, tell me where it comes from. It, this actually, I can tell you where it comes from in the gate supergravity. It's a combination of several terms um, uh -huh. that are not super transparent. Where they, right? This is a supergravity analysis that this Kasani Faedo analysis that basically looks at all of these terms. And we then said, okay, we are interested in topological couplings that precisely will correspond to. Uh, backgrounds for one form symmetry, for example. Right? Mm -hmm. So it's it's something that right, I think in, in any such setup, uh, it will depend on the type of background that you have picked. Right? I and see. It will formally indeed 
come from something like you take your 10 dimensional action and then you do expansions of all the forms and then you write down the couplings. Now then I will challenge you to get precisely this factor one over two M, which right. is absolutely crucial. Mm -hmm. right? So mm -hmm. it's it's not it's not you know difficult, I think, to extract out a coupling that looks vaguely like some mixed anomaly coupling. Right. Mm -hmm. To actually do this reduction, you really want to get the correct coefficient and everything of it. And I right. think that's sort of a slightly more non-trivial exercise. Yeah. Thanks. And this you would not see in the ADS case, right? Just to be clear, this is literally for, this is the coupling you would have for the, this uh, confining uh, right. cascade. Right. Right. So, okay, so I'm actually finishing. Um, so summary, um, I don't think I need to talk about point one, point two. Um, so one point I'd like to make is from the geometry, you learn this, I think, really crucial object, which is the structure group, which from which you then can derive the higher form symmetry, the global form of flavor, um, but also all the possible higher group structures that could be there in the theory. In holography, basic boundary conditions on these topological top lengths and these the supergravity theories that you get from reducing on the internal spaces tell you things about top anomalies. Uh, for example, this mixed anomaly that we just talked about. And so that's sort of a nice playground of now exploring perhaps other uh, holographic settings uh, that have interesting, uh, perhaps confining or other interesting uh, anomalies that uh, could arise. Anyway, what are extensions, future directions? Um, one thing that would be nice is to test some of these global structures that would come out of these uh, things I discussed in the first part of the talk. Um, one other thing that's perhaps a bit more speculative is sometimes really certain anomalies will force you to have certain topological sectors in the theory uh, to cancel and match certain top anomalies. Um, can actually string theory or empty realizations furnish these sectors? Uh, that's far from clear, but I think you know, if string theory is, is sort of really in capturing all these different uh, features of quantum field theories, I think it should. So that'd be interesting to understand how one would uh, pin such things down. And um, in terms of this holographic setting, well, uh, I'm definitely at the time I did not follow this literature, uh, but there are certainly these two types of solutions, the Klavnos Tesler, Malcina Nunez which are essentially NS5 or D5 uh, uh, brain wrapped on two cycles and the holographic duals of that. And this relies on this relatively simple geometry, which is this deformed conifold, but actually really related to this discussion we had with um, uh, Yifan just now, uh, you could anticipate thinking of more complicated hypersurface singularities, deform them, um, and even though you will not find anything remotely as this complete Clevenos Strasse solution, you might still have a chance of actually extracting sort of the interesting topological couplings and learn something about the dual theories, which won't be CFTs after you do these deformations. So that might be interesting. And of course, the final point is there are many constructions of lower dimensional uh, field theories starting with M5 brains and the one form symmetries confinement in that context. And that's something that will happen next week in Lakshav's talk. And so I'll thank you for your questions and your attention. Um, and I, I see there's already another question. So um, oh, sorry, I switched it off. Uh, so please uh, ask your question. Ah. Uh, uh, thank you uh, very much, Sakura, for a very nice talk. I have two questions, but they are not. Yeah. They are also questions uh, slash comments. So, yeah. one of them is uh, you show this duality cascade, and at the end mm -hmm. you show this mixed anomaly between uh, yeah. zero form chiral symmetry and one form yeah. enter symmetry. Yeah. So since um, since uh, you know uh, since the mixed anomaly is an RG invariant concept, it should probably exist in the very UV theory. It does. So yeah. this actually is completely independent of this K. Uh, yeah. Right, so K was basically, uh, or, or this radial direction. So you, this, this term you have along the entire flow. 
Okay, good. So it's a nice check then to show that the mixed anomalies of all these theories in this cascade yep. are actually exactly. matching. With, that's okay, right. that's one thing. Good. Uh, the other thing is that I think uh, you didn't mention anything about non-invertible symmetry. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think that at least for confinement, it will mm -hmm. become very important concept. Uh, okay. Especially explaining the behavior of the string tension at some intermediate length scales, or in some right. cases, it is exact. Mm -hmm. um, do you have any, any comments on non-invertible symmetry? How I would see this holographically? Um, ah, no. That's what, roughly my question, yeah. Yes. Uh, that's a good question. I don't know. Um, but uh, to be fair to you, in the theories you discussed in this talk, they are all approximates, but in the large end, they become exact somehow. Right. Okay, the large number of color limit. Right. Yeah, I don't know. I will have to think about it. Yes, sorry. Oh, no worries. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks. Thanks. Any other questions? Uh, can I ask a question? Sure. Uh, so, so, so I think this is probably related to the first part uh, uh, of yeah. your talk. Uh, so, uh, so you mentioned that there's this uh, um, this e uh, discrete group that you identify from geometry yeah. that should be quotient when you want to identify the actual symmetries. Yeah. Uh, so now from geometry, is there a way to gauge this E uh, back again? So then you get the, actually the simpler structure when it's just a product. Like, uh, is there some way I can think about this quick gauging in the geometry side? Yeah. Um, so you want to basically... Uh, so if I gauge this in zero forms. Yeah. So I don't know how you do it in practice. Um, mm. we, what we did find, and, and I, we discussed this right last year, um, there are, if you, and maybe this is sort of maybe the place where you might be more lucky finding uh, such things is when you um, look at these sort of geometries that don't have fully resolved things. They might have, for example, additional, three form symmetries, which correspond to like gauging. Right. Uh -huh, uh -huh, uh -huh, uh -huh. So it's possible that something like that uh -huh, you know, uh -huh. will then have a different, you know, so so I could imagine that once you have these kind of additional term, like your know, remnant singularities, this intersection calculation would get modified. Um, I see. That would be maybe a way of doing this, but I don't know how to do it in practice, right? So. You, I couldn't tell you how I now start with the geometry for the SU20 theory and do something to it, like tag on a terminal singularity and then ungage that. Yeah. Right. So it's a good question. I think that that's certainly a sort of open thing that needs discussing how one goes between, in particular, zero form symmetry gaugings explicitly. Yeah. Thanks. Any other questions? So I have a, a question similar to Ethan's. So you mentioned that for the two group symmetry, you can gauge the one form part, one get a mix of zero, two form yeah. uh, normally. That's so, right. So uh, is that geometric? And um, can one um, see this uh, anomaly just by looking at the color VL? Or uh, in terms yeah, of the two group symmetry? Yes. So, mm -hmm. for class, is that also identified with some geometric? Yes, that's a great question. So a simpler question that is, is sort of actually something that I'm trying to understand is, can you see this mixed anomaly uh, that I just discussed for the uh, pure young males in the case when you're looking at the G2 compactifications or whatever, right? Um, so, here actually, right, so take, this particular G2, is there a way to see from, you're asking basically a, a general, more general question. Can you see if you have a compactification with some, that results in, in a gauge series, say with some one form symmetry or something, is it possible 
to see the anomalies of this in terms of just the M theory or string theory. And I think a similar thing to what we did in, this, in the second part in this holographic setup uh, should be possible to extract couplings that you know, would, for example, uh, provide this, this background field for the two form for the one form symmetry. And also if you have a real, I think one of the challenges is really to see the R symmetry realized geometrically. And if you have that, then you should be able to see it too. Um, it's a bit easier in these holographic settings because things like R symmetry and so on, they're all geometrized already. Uh, but yeah, that'd be great to see uh, even just in this particular, much simpler setting um, like this. No, uh, it's a great question. Yeah, I see. I don't know the answer. answer yet. Hmm? But, uh, but I guess you are pointing out that uh, it should be the interplay between string theory and geometry that leads to this interesting high group structure, right? So if I just look at geometry side, maybe the only interesting high group that I can identify is its fundamental two group. But I guess that's very different from what. Uh, yeah, no, it, it is absolutely the, the, the interplay between the empty and, geome and, and geometry. It's sort of the empty, it tells you what the rules are, what kind of states yeah. you have. Basically, all of the particles in the, all, all the, rules of how you go from the M theory via some compactification to um, a field theory, that's basically the dictionary that you need. Yeah. And I think just looking at the geometry in a slightly more refined way, actually really taking account all the effects in the geometry is important to also see all the effects in the field theory. I think that's sort of maybe the, the summary of that part of the talk. Yeah. So you would, for example, if you naively sort of compute uh, sort of Coulomb branch, uh, just the, the intersection of these curves, and you don't look at these non-compact divisors, you may be misled to think that there's not this extension group E. Mm -hmm. um, so that's sort of data in the geometry that you need to actually take into account uh, to really infer correct things about the filter. Good, thanks. Um, any other questions? But if not, uh, I, oh, can I ask uh, another question? Sorry. Sure. Uh, do you have the uh, results for the structure of the flavor symmetry for the other uh, rank one theories? Uh, yeah, uh, actually in the making, yes. Oh, in the making, okay. Yeah, ENF, yes. Yeah. I see. Yeah. But it is true that the always reduced to the, you know, the centerless, uh, Group to the what? So it's the flavor symmetry always reduced to the centerless global form. I think yeah, but again, it's it's more refined. So the important thing is to again identify what is this cur this this group E, and then really do this projection all this. So you indeed you will quotient out by some Z two. So mm -hmm, actually, mm -hmm. we only looked I think at the S U two with some number of flavors, but yeah, we will look at the other ones too. Uh, but do you know I examples know. where actually the where the extra uh, when you study carefully uh, the, that the flavor symmetry yeah, actually has flavor a symmetry center? is not just a simply connected version. Yeah. So here in this table, um, so for example, right, so the flavor sometimes is uh, not. So for example, mm, I see. Two okay. factors, I see. I see. I see. Um, I see. I see. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Um, there is an, one more comment. Uh, there is an interesting way to, to get a higher form, uh, higher group structure, I'm sorry, higher group structure in say uh, four dimensional gauge theories. If you restrict the instanton sum, uh, not count all the instanton sectors, yeah. but restrict the instanton yeah. sum to multiples of P instanton, for example, yeah. then uh, it turns out that that system does not only have one form symmetry, but it also yeah. has some three form uh, symmetry. Uh -huh. And exactly uh, along the lines you suggest, uh, these two things are not independent right. of each other and they, okay. they form a, a higher group. And okay. I think it would be very, you know, nice to see how this is realized. How oh, that actually works, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Ge geometrically, yeah. Right, absolutely, yes. 
So we can maybe switch off the video and then we can have a more lengthy discussion with Luigi and maybe Pietro about the anomaly. I'm happy to do this, but not on not on record. <laughs> <laughs> Okay.